probably should just start by saying I'm just like you guys. I'm just a faculty member kind of slugging it out uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it is great to be back in Illinois, although I'll tell you that I told folks earlier that I met with, uh, so we're late coming into Chicago. Are you surprised? They kept us on the ground for 55 extra minutes in Dallas yesterday waiting because of the weather conditions in Chicago. So I was all braced for that because I've been following Chicago on the weather for days. You know, so we are on approach and the pilot comes on and says, well, we're going to just kind of fly over to Iowa a little bit and, you know, and then, okay, so we're flying around and, you know, we can't see anything because it's all clouds. I mean, you're just flying in this white fluff. You know, and so the lady next to me says, you know, I think they're going to land a little bit later than we thought. And I said, I think so too. You know, so we're just flying and we're flying and we're flying. And she says, do you see anything on the ground? And I'm like, no, I see nothing. You know, Chicago has tall buildings. You know, we see nothing. And so I'm kind of glanced out the window and I'm like expletive deleted. Because it's like all of a sudden the ground is there. The pilot is actually bringing the thing down, but the fog is so intense here that you don't see that there is a ground until you're about 15 feet above it, and then you land on it. I mean, I just gasped in the process, which was only matched later by the ride over here to DeKalb in the car, <laughs> driving along in this sort of white tunnel. I don't, I've never, I grew up in Houston. We had fog. I don't know what you guys have, but it's not fog. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just something like I had never, ever seen before in my entire life. So I got here. It was, it was very neat. I kept trying. The driver was laughing because I had my iPhone out. I was trying to take pictures out the window to try to show people back in Texas tomorrow, you know, what it's going to look. This is what it looked like in Illinois. This is amazing <laughs> stuff. You should go there sometime in the winter just to see this thing they call fog, you know, because the fields, the guy says, here's a cornfield. And I'm like, there is no cornfield. I mean, there's just white that goes like a curve into more white. I mean, you know, I couldn't even imagine where the corn came from. But we made it. Uh, and so that was really, really good. And so we'll see how Friday night goes going out of Chicago back to Dallas, which has a horrible track record on Friday evening arrivals. So it's great to be back here. It's great to talk to you about uh, something that has become a passion for me on, on the teaching side. And really, um, one of the things that, that my interests have morphed towards steadily, and I hope yours are too, is not so much teaching as learning, student learning. So I wanted to kind of take you back to the beginning of, of my career, because I actually started my career not in higher ed, but with IBM. Uh, which makes me very strange. I joined the, the large system division of IBM in 1980. You know, so you're probably thinking to yourself, what are you doing here? And, and I'm wondering that too as I approach retirement and I contemplate the differences in income between uh, IBM and higher ed, which are significantly different. But I tell you this because we live in extraordinarily exciting times. Sometimes we don't catch that because we're too busy figuring out how we're going to get from A to B, you know, we have kids that need this or we are missing this deadline or that. But actually, if you step back with me just for a moment and think, the growth in the availability of information over the last several years is stunning. Google now has digitized all of the life's works, all of the classic works from the beginning of time where we actually wrote things down. They're all digital. I remember when I was in grad school in Ireland years ago, I had access to the old library. So I could go pull books off of the shelf that were published in the late 1700s. And I thought I was like the way coolest person ever because you could touch something old. Well, now you don't have to touch that stuff. I mean, it's digitized. But even more stunning than that is the knowledge base today, which is doubling itself every two years. Every two years, the knowledge base is doubling. So you think about that for a second and you kind of go, I mean, it's really stunning. But when you couple that with what's happening with processor speeds, especially when I think about my days at IBM, it's, it's really an amazing thing. So these two things that I'm talking to you about, nanophotonic silicon devices and Synapse are both IBM partnership creations. Nanophotonic silicon chips 
are going to replace in short order completely our old ideas of electronics. So you have uh, signals now traveling over you know, copper wires. Those generate heat. And our ability to reach certain speeds is kind of impeded at a certain point. Not if you use pulses of light. Those travel at phenomenal speeds. They don't generate the same amount of heat. So you can pack more and more power in less and less space for less and less energy usage in the process. So that's kind of stunning. What's even more stunning is these chips are projected to run at 100 times the speed of the human brain in the next five years. In the next five years. In the next five years. So couple that with Synapse. And these are just two particular technological achievements. Synapse, IBM, in conjunction with four other institutions of higher learning, this Department of Defense Development, which is a, a particular kind of chip that's built like neuronal networks in the human brain. And what's really remarkable about this chip is it learns. It learns. And it doesn't have to have special programming to do it. Supercomputers today have artificial intelligence, and they do learn, but they've required tons and tons of programming to do it. This one now actually can run a car on a racetrack by itself and gets better and better at it as it goes along the way. So think for a second what those two things mean coupled. It means artificial intelligence is going to go freaking wild. It's going to touch everything from medicine to robotics. Uh, and you already see this in so many ways just in watching your phone technology uh, and your TV technology and some other stuff. But again, remember, we're busy doing life all of the time, and we're probably not paying much attention to this. So query is getting crazier by the day. Query where you type something into Google is going to become passe very, very quickly. Why do I need to type it when I can tell it? Tell me the answer to this. And then you have things moving at that kind of speed. And so for us in higher ed, if we really step back and think about this for a second, this is super crazy. Because we've been in the business of delivering content for so very long. And if you think about what this means, what does it mean now to deliver content? And in fact, if we go a step further, what does this mean about research? You know, So what is happening in higher education? Well, unfortunately, we've got a schism underway. And you really are aware of this if you think about it. And the schism is, even though technology is moving ahead at incredible speeds, advances in learning are not keeping up. So we're much better at creating super smart robots than we are at figuring out how to teach the little units that face us on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom. So if you look at what, uh, there's a really cool book if you haven't read it, Losing Our Minds. Uh, Keeling and Hirsch, what will hold America back in this century is the quality and quantity, quality and quantity of student learning in college, metaphorically speaking. We are losing our minds, and you can see the results of this. This data is slightly old. College attainment rate for the U.S. for 25 to 34 year olds. The United States, in spite of our wealth, in spite of these magnificent institutions of higher education, in spite of the sheer number of the institutions of higher education, we are frickin' 14th out of 37. And if we took that snapshot on today's data, I feel relatively certain we wouldn't be number 14. I think it might go the other direction. And if we're really honest with ourselves, folks, and if we're looking at what's in front of us in the classroom, we've got kids that love technology. They are texting, playing, Googling, you know, whatever else. They're apping, mapping, zapping, you know, having a wonderful time. But they're really not prepared for college work. Their writing skills are deplorable in many, many instances. Their reading skills, well, let's just say they don't do that anymore. Why would I need to bother reading it? Somebody else can tell me a summary of it. I can get it on Spark Notes, or somebody else can spark my spark. But you know, why would I bother to do something that takes time like reading something, even though, by the way, it's already digitized you know, and available to them? Their critical thinking and analysis skills, if you leave them alone, they can find the answers, but they don't know the questions, stupid. They don't know what questions to ask to even know where they should start to find the answers. This is a significant problem. They suck at face-to-face -face social skills. I mean, they really are not good at this at all. I mean, I, 
Does anybody know anything about this? You see it in your classrooms? Um, these kids are wonderful in some other ways. This is the most tolerant generation we've seen in an incredibly long time. They don't mind blackness, brownness, yellowness, purpleness, whatever it is. They're okay with it. They don't mind. Uh, they don't care what you do. But they really aren't so great at taking on the perspective of others. They get in groups together and they fight with each other. So they'll tolerate you, but they'll argue with you until you want to have a drinking problem. You know? So how many of you are also seeing students that come in and they equate trying and succeeding? And it usually is at the end of the semester, usually the week before finals, they'll come in and look at you. They've finally looked at Blackboard and they say, this is not fair. This is totally not fair because I have tried so hard. I've been to all of the classes. I have opened and looked at every assignment. I've tried. And I'm making a D. And that's not right. People that try should get at least a B. Hello? No. I mean, that would be like your surgeon saying, I really tried hard. I haven't opened a book in surgery since 1940 much less pick up anything, and I'm really sorry that you died, you know, but I tried really hard for you not to. You know, it just didn't work out well. They have this Moses factor. Maybe this is something you don't see in Illinois, but it's something that we see a lot in Texas, which is they wander around from major to major, or they just try out a course and say, yeah, I'm out of here on this one. I'll go someplace else. And so we have excess hours like crazy. You know, so rather than finishing a degree in 120 hours, they're at 150 hours or 160 hours or 170 hours, and then they wander in. This is one of my faves. You know, Dr. McCoy, I'm graduating in December or May, fill in the blank, or August, and I don't really want, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I, I've got to get a job, but I don't even know where to start. Well, I don't look at you guys. I've heard that about... 17 times this week, you know? Yeah. How can this be? <laughs> That's, you've never introduced yourself. So we have to ask ourselves if we really care. <laughs> this, I realized, it's so funny. I put this presentation together before I read about the strikes in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> then I decided that slide was really appropriate. Um, over space and time, but in higher ed, we have to ask ourselves what really is happening. And, and I'll tell you, we've got rapid change on one front and higher education as a culture, and I think that if we're really honest with ourselves, we recognize that it is totally entrenched and non-changing. The primary focus in higher education today remains on research and entrepreneurship as it relates to research, not entrepreneurship as it relates to us dare us to try to do anything different in higher ed that remakes the face of our own institution. We're in the business of remaking other people's institutions and telling them how screwed up they are. We haven't been so willing to turn the mirror to ourselves and say, wow, technology has moved ahead in so many ways, but we're still stuck using older technology, or we're not even equipped to use technology in new ways, or we haven't given thought to our own institutions in critical ways. And we were talking about this in earlier meetings, we stay utterly isolated in personal and disciplinary silos and or. And we love it there, and I am one of those. I have met the enemy, and it is me. I love doing my own thing, my own way, in my own time, and I don't like to consult with other people about it. That's one of the reasons I came to higher ed. And oh, by the way, I'm wonderful at criticizing other people. That's what they taught us to do when we got our doctorate. You know, criticize ruthlessly which doesn't make us play nice in the sandbox with our colleagues and other people. There's a lack of emphasis in the academy on teaching, on training for teaching, and we certainly wouldn't dream of rewarding it. Because after all, back to square A, research is where it's all at. And oh, by the way, I just want to put a personal commercial in here on the research thing. If you go back to my first slide again and you think about the crazy, crazy things that are happening in development, go do some research of your own and go take a look at who the richest units are now on the planet, and they're all under 30 years of age. The new giant billionaires are the idea people out there creating all kinds of new things that most of us would never dream anybody would want. You know, does that make sense? They've got gazillions of dollars 
to do that with. And the new, these, these initial chip things that IBM is in, uh, doing work on, that's private sector research, usually only done in conjunction with about four other institutions. We're not asking ourselves what all this means even on the bigger picture. So back to teaching for a minute and the assumption that we have, the unexamined assumption that somehow our disciplinary expertise translates into good teaching skills. Really? That's like being a good surgeon translates into people skills. When was the last time you met a surgeon that you wanted to go have a drink with? I mean, they're really usually not very nice people. I mean, you know, they're, and it's okay, we say to ourselves, that's okay. They don't have to be comforting as long as they're good with the knife. Does that make sense? But we don't assume that people can be good at different things and that we maybe should consider that we need to deploy people in different ways in higher ed. We have growing numbers of part-time faculty, I mean like adjunct faculty, and in growing numbers of lecture class faculty, and we have the most entrenched hierarchy you've ever seen in terms of those people must be the worst, and then there's the middle worst, and then there's the people at the top. And we don't think about what that means for us in higher education over space and time. Although your colleagues uh, in Chicago obviously went out altogether because they're starting to recognize that so many adjuncts, so many lecturers translates into putting a disproportionate service load on the tenure class faculty. Does that make sense? And so maybe they are starting to recognize we are all in this together in so many very interesting ways. Mm-hmm. I love you. Well, I just have to say that it's probably, since he's your son-in-law, a good thing that you do drink with him. That's right. Do you like how he treats your daughter? You're, you're tolerating him. But he takes good care of your daughter-in-law. Yeah. Oh, God. I, wouldn't you say that the whole institution of education, it, I can't use my example that I used earlier because I'm on tape. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> my intestinal example of what goes in comes out at some point. And we're at the end of where it's starting to come out. Um, so I think that you have to look at K-12 and you have to say to yourself, what's been happening at K-12? And we kind of think of ourselves as the end of the pipeline, but we're not. Earlier discussion with uh, your uh, faculty fellows in CTP, bottom line is these folks are leaving us and moving into nursing school, med school, law school, graduate school, and faculty in those areas are going, what? I mean, they're, they're not ready. They're not any more ready for what folks thought they needed to be there than we think they're ready for what we're receiving. And I think the real question we need to be asking ourselves is, do we abdicate and say, I don't want to teach etiquette, you know, to, I, I teach junior level courses. Why do I need to teach you that it's rude to walk in front of a speaker or that you don't, you don't write an email to your professor that says, yo, you know, that that's not going to fly really well with authority figures when you get into the workplace. So the answer is, do we abdicate or do we, make other kinds of decisions. And I would say, you take the hand that you're dealt. You play the hand you're dealt. I don't like it, and I'm gonna whine about it. But I still think, what, what is our choice? I mean, if, if you believe in education like I do, if you believe in education like I do, and I think you do, we can't afford to give up on this. This has much broader implications for us in our social system than giving up on some of the other social institutions that are fracturing. I mean, this one, this one must work for us if we are gonna be effective in the global world over space and time.
I think that you're right. The freshman year is like the year that we set expectations, although we can't forget our transfer students because they aren't necessarily starting at the same place in the pipeline and we have to rethink how we pull them into the fold as well uh, in the process. That I think that you're absolutely right. I think we also have to think about the fact that we're still using pedagogical approaches that were part or remnants of the agrarian periods of time and that we haven't considered that when we're all time, anytime, everywhere, everything else, when you can text in the middle of the night, when TV is 24-7, uh, when you can go to the movies, eat, and do everything else, why we continue to s insist on semester boundaries that really were set up so that people could work the farms in the summertime instead of rethinking our offering processes and how we let students learn. It really is beyond me. And ask yourself again why we continue or are addicted to fact-based learning and assessing on fact-based learning in an information society that those facts are changing as rapidly as they are and they're so easy to get to, so incredibly easy to get to. Here's the other thing I think that we have to really step back a minute and give some thought to because a lot of times I think that we assume that teaching, good teaching is automatically gonna produce learning. And I would say to you that that's fallacious reasoning because to assume that teaching equals good learning is similar to assuming that manufacturing processes always produce, even if they're good ones, products that people want. And so I show you a product that rolled out last year, watermelon Oreos. <laughs> now, many of you may be like me and love Oreo cookies. I love Oreos and I eat them the same way. I screw the top off like I'm three. I scrape the sugar into my mouth, and then I eat, I mean, look at that look. He's like, you are such a moron. That's what he's saying. I mean, and it's true. It's totally true. So I eat it just like I'm five or three or whatever. Love Oreo cookies. You know, they're processed. They're probably bad for me. They probably got everything wrong with them. It doesn't matter. They've got it figured out. People love to eat them. Oreo comes up with all of these other ways to get you to eat their stuff, and they way screwed up. Watermelon Oreos. They tasted horrible. They have these god-awful colors when you take the thing off the top and people look at that and go, you, good manufacturing processes, a great company, and they produce something at the end that people said, what? We don't think about that so much. We, we might be great instructors, great teachers, great institutions of higher ed producing a student product that people go, what? You know. We need to give more thought to what our products are in higher education. And that kind of goes on several lines. Quality, for example. At my university, one of the things that the provost is harping on right now is he wants higher entering SAT scores. And if you, if you pull, and it's a good thing he's not here, if you pull the assumptions away on that, the idea is that we'll do better if we have better materials to start with. Well, that's great. Not everybody's gonna get all of those fine materials for the most part, but the other thing that I think is if we're gonna be global citizens, you have to consider that 1.2 billion people in the world today live on $1.25 a day or less. There's a huge market out there for taking folks that are not as prepared and building them into something different. If we are gonna make the world a better place truly in the end, we can't automatically say if you're not totally prepared the way that we think you need to be, we give up. You know, we're not going to deal with it. The only way we make our world truly better, and we know this in social science, we know the birth rates fall totally in connection with how educated women are. We know that people that are educated are more tolerant and that get along better with other folks. And we've got a whole bunch of people in the world that are just left out of the process altogether. We have a whole lot of people in the United States who are left out of this process altogether. And I would suggest to you to abdicate and say, I can only be effective if you give me only perfectly good stuff that comes in this form. We may be missing some incredible diamonds in the rough. And I think some of you have seen these, people that come from families that maybe haven't had college educated parents and given the right opportunities, they bloom in unbelievable kinds of ways. We are seeing students come into the United States from India, from China, from other places that don't have the benefits that we do, and they, by God, bloom. 
I mean, they haven't had the opportunities that we've had, and they've done great. The question of enrollment, quantity. How many do you want? Well, at my university, we've got a brand new president. We're more brand new than you are. I can trump you. Two weeks. We've already lost the entire financial team. It's been very interesting back at Denton America. Denton America, things are, people are being shot, not with bullets. There's a lot of people that are under the table these days, hoping for, they're running for cover. But the new president said, we've got some initiatives here. One of them is budget, really, because we have no money. Um, you might know something about that. Two, uh, the second initiative is we want more students. Of course we do, because that goes to the problem one, budget. And the third initiative is when we get them here, we won't keep them. That's called retention. We've been singing that retention song for a while. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the faculty's going, really? Help me understand how this retention thing works, you know, with some of the quality issues that we're seeing coming in. So I think that one of the things that we have to think about is really what kind of pipeline do we want to bring in? And when we get this pipeline in, what can we realistically do on the learning standpoint? And oh, by the way, it's probably not good enough anymore to say, well, if I have 100 students in the class, that's just not going to work out. I think that we're smarter than that. And I think that we can figure out ways. By the way, there's a brand new MOOC that's being offered at the, the, the premier technical institution in, in, in Israel, in Israel, taught by an Arab, an Arab Israeli. That's pretty fun, isn't it? And so it's on nanotechnology. It already had 4,800 students enrolled in this particular course. And folks were so excited across the Arab world, and they stayed enrolled even after they discovered this guy is an Arab who lives in Israel, which is sort of interesting when you think about it, which says it goes to the whole idea of why education is such a cool thing, that at certain points, ideas and our desire to learn and do good things start to transcend some of this other stuff that we tangle ourselves up in all of the time, which is really remarkable. So this last bullet, we can only benefit if we learn from our mistakes, which means A, we have to be willing to make them, which we're not really good at either. We got to be professors because we were stupid A students. We love to get it right all the time. We don't like to fail. We don't like to have to see that it doesn't work out for us, but we encourage our students to try things and fail, just not us, just not me. You know. So I put this picture over here on the side because anybody remember the Apple Newton product? There it is on the right. Failed abysmally. Just, it came out in 1993. Sucked sewer water. Horrible. An, an incredible arrangement. What's so cool about that was Apple was willing to take everything that they learned from that product failure and roll it into two products that just kicked butt. The iPad and their smartphones. So the idea there is that we can also learn. Now, I, I wanted to say one of the things about MOOCs. 2012, the year of the MOOC, everybody said, oh my God, it's free. You know, it's going to kill higher education. I mean, you know, it's really bad. And so we were all quaking and worrying. And, and so 2013 comes along, people are going, well, these MOOCs, people, they've got retention problems. Well, sure they do. You know, sure they've got retention problems. But I'm here to tell you, MOOCs aren't going away. MOOC is Newton. MOOC is here to stay. MOOC is reinventing the way education works, which is transinstitutional, transnational, and it remaps discipline boundaries. Nanotechnology doesn't just apply to computer science. It applies to whole rays of sciences in the process. And so it goes again to this idea of we're still in our disciplinary silos, and maybe we need to give some thought to some of this stuff. So I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves today is what's college for? What is college for? Well, if it's to get, how many of you say, well, you have to get a college to get a job. Well, you sure do. But the problem is, is that that kind of leads to means in thinking about things. And you may see this. I'm just here to get the, I'm just here to get a degree. Please don't change me in the process. Just hand me that piece of paper. I regularly tell my students, that's equivalent to me putting a sign on myself that says, I'm a beauty queen. It doesn't work. 
I mean, I can have the label. I could probably find somebody that would give me a credential that says I'm a beauty queen. It does not change the material fact that I am not a beauty queen and never have been. Do you see what I'm saying? Education is a process of being changed along the way. Here's another one, the laws of capitalism. The more degrees we produce, it seems like the less value that they have, prompting Sir Ken Robertson to say suddenly they don't seem to be worth anything anymore. So once upon a time, if you had a degree, it meant a job. Today, students are entering the most difficult marketplaces that we've ever seen uh, to be able to compete. And oh, by the way, we're not sending out a lot of competitive students. But put that against the fact that great estimates are saying that in just a few short years, if you don't have a degree, you're not going to be eligible for about 60% of the jobs in the US marketplace alone. It's not OK to not have one. And at the same time, our students that have them struggle with that because a lot of times, the income from the degrees that they have are insufficient to pay off their loans. Back to the Moses factor of wandering in the wilderness and just generating debt like crazy you know, that they have to pay for and don't really get. But aren't we really asking ourselves some other questions like, isn't a college degree worth more or about more than just getting a job? You know, it, isn't it, isn't it something bigger than that? Really, if we're asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Isn't it more than just that? I mean, we have jobs, but what about after we don't have the job? Isn't college worth something about that too? And how do you train kids today for jobs that don't yet exist? And that's kind of scary to think about too, because if you think about it, this whole thing is coming upside down so rapidly, a lot of the jobs that are going to exist in 2025, we don't even know what they are today. It's very, very interesting. So as long as we're talking about jobs, I have this great story. So I'm sitting in the Dallas airport, and my assistant has called me right before, you know, I'm, I just am getting to the airport, so I say, I'll call you right back. I've got to get through security. So I call her back. I'm sitting outside security, and there's a woman kind of sitting next to me, you know, Brenda, you know, you have this student, he wants to drop the class, and you know, et cetera. I said, well, what, tell me, sign on to Blackboard, tell me what his grades are, because we only have till today for him to do this without penalty. So uh, he's failing, he's failing. So I said, why is he dropping? Well, he's dropping two classes. So I said, how many is he taking? Well, he's taking four. Why is he dropping two classes? What, what's going on? I said, put him on the phone. So he gets on the phone, I'm like, what are you doing? Well, my job is harder than I thought, and I'm having trouble with this, and so I'm dropping two classes. And I said, Grant, you're failing my class. I have to drop you WF. Well, really? I said, you, you've missed some quizzes. You've been absent. You know, there are some problems here. He says, well, OK, you know, I, but I'm really a good student. My average is 3.5 put my assistant back on the phone, pull his transcript. Sure enough, he is. He's a 3.5 student. Back to retention. So now I'm just like, ah! You know, because if I give him a WF, it smacks his GPA, you know, non-traditional kind of student. So I say, put him back on the phone. So I don't realize that this lady sitting next to me is listening to this conversation. So, so I get him on the phone and I said, you need to take five seconds and get ready to be chewed up by an old fat person because I'm like way unhappy with you. What the heck are you thinking? You really are a good student, you know? And so I chew on him. You know, I'm gonna take care of this, but you know, never again. If I, you know, I run this program, if you show up again, you're like smoked. I understand, thank you, you know? So get off the phone, the lady said, are you a professor? I said, yes. She goes, I just wanna thank you because I have kids in college and I wanna think that somebody would yell at my kids like that. <laughs> I said, wow. So we start talking. Turns out that she and her husband own a very large dental lab in uh, the Dallas area. In fact, they own several of them. And so she starts saying, you know, we're really having problems with graduates these days coming into work. I said, really? So she starts going through the characteristics of the graduates that she's having. I said, just a moment. So I open my laptop up, pull up your presentation. And I said, read this. Have I missed anything? And she said, you really kind of messed one of those up. I said, really? And she said, yeah, that last bullet, believe they should only work nine to five. She said, that's not true. 
She said they really believe they should be able to come in at 920 and be gone by 440 and that that's really okay on a regular basis. I said, oh, so if we think about this, we've got kids just on, on several base fronts that aren't performing well for us in the workplace, which is not reflecting back on us very nicely. Go to some of the recruiting things and talk to the employers, Target, and other people that come in for your graduates and listen to them tell you some of the problems they're having, like kids don't know how to dress, or they don't know how to stay off their phones, or they certainly don't care about what customers, although they as a consumer are ruthless. Um, they can't write good letters. They don't know how to handle emails. They want to call the boss by their first name for the first day. Um, they just think they should be rewarded for coming. You know, I need a raise now. I came for two weeks. You know, so we're not, we're not getting it there somehow on this particular front. So I, I guess what I would say to you is, if we're really thinking about this, isn't college not just about job prep, but isn't it something more than that? Isn't it more than a continuation of high school? Shouldn't we really, at the end of the day, be producing thoughtful, thoughtful, thoughtful citizens that grow intellectually, personally, socially, and morally in the process? And shouldn't the people that we send out be both a personal and a social good? I mean, shouldn't the kids that come out of here think about these things in different kinds of ways? And for me, it's, as our folks, uh, Hirsch and Keeling say on, on We're Losing Our Minds, aren't we really in the business of changing minds? I used to think this way, but now I think this way. I mean, isn't that really where you really get the crack rush of teaching when a student looks at you for the first time and says, wow. I mean, for me, those are like the moments of ecstasy. It's like to watch those light bulbs go along. So basically, I would say if you're looking at student learning, the first place that facilitating student learning starts is being able to answer that question for yourself. If you don't know what college is for anymore and you haven't thought about that recently, you're never going to have engaged learning because you're not going to know where you're driving the ship. You're really not going to. If, if you think it's just for a job, oh, we're not doing very well on that front, especially if people were measuring us for that. I, I think it's really an important question. So I think most of us, if we could back away for a second, we would say we really want three C's to show up in the process. We really want critical thinkers. All of us are trained to say this now, like little trained dogs, bring out a treat, and we pant and go, critical thinking, you know, because that's the right answer. We say, we want to be critical thinkers, because we really do. We want them to be able to navigate through masses of information that, by the way, is multiplying at rates that we can't even comprehend. And we want them, by the way, to be able to differentiate between ideology and fact, because little monsters are big bloggers today. They think that what they write on the essay questions is their favorite opinion about something, and that you should throw them a big bone for writing their opinion, at which point I've been writing back a lot that says, I don't really care about your opinion. I really want to understand how well you can argue based on a set of very nicely researched facts, you know, and that you can demonstrate that those are really good. I want them to be able to tackle difficult social issues and social problems because we've got them and they're growing also exponentially. As we become a global world, the stuff that we're dealing with isn't just at the end of the local city limits. I mean, if we're not taking into account what's happening in China, we're really missing it. I mean, we need to be thinking about what's happening here and what's happening in other places as well. We need kids to be more creative because if you think about it, it isn't just education that's broken. Think about the other institutions that don't seem to be working well. Have you seen what the opinion polls say about approval ratings for Congress? Does anybody know what the approval rating is for Congress about right now? I think that's high. I think that's high. I think it's pretty low. What about the Supreme Court? The president, I think, has one of the higher ones in the 40s. The last time I checked, if someone made a 40 in your class, they failed. They failed. 
We don't even think about that. What does it mean for us to live in a society today where we have no confidence in the structure of our democratic governance? What does that mean? And the kids today take it for granted. They've learned to laugh at it, a.k.a. Colbert, you know, John Stewart. What does that mean? It's not just education that's fracturing. Government is. I mean, churches, nobody goes to church, but we're all spiritual. At the same time, we use religion today as the greatest instrument of hate that anybody has ever seen. We annihilate people in the name of God. It's remarkable. And if you don't think your kids don't get that dissonance and disconnect, they do. They totally get it. They totally get it. So we've got these really interesting social institutions, and we've got a foot on one side and a foot on the other side. But you know what? They're not coming back to our side. They grew up in a different world than we did. They're not coming to our place. We've got to go to theirs, which means that we need them to be continuous learners, and we need to be continuous learners at the same time. The workplace is changing. The world is changing. We need kids that develop a persistent sense of curiosity and that are not just willing to try to be fit physically, but that are willing to be fit intellectually. And that's hard to do in an age where it's so freaking easy just to get the answer. We quit thinking. We've, we've quit thinking. We just looked for answers. So I want you to take just a minute at your tables and just have a little discussion, just for fun, and tell me what you think your students really need to learn in the 21st century. You know, what knowledge or skills do you think are most relevant? And what kinds of non-disciplinary specific learning activities and experiences do you think are important? And if you have even a little bit more time after that, she says with some level of sarcasm, tell me what way you think the best way is for students to acquire this knowledge and skills. Passive, active, in the classroom, other places, alone, sitting on a building, you know, what is the best way for that to happen? So take just a few minutes, talk amongst yourself, and let's see how well you all agree with each other on what students need to learn. So now I've got that do, 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 do. What skills? Everybody's like, I don't want to be called on. This is just like being a student. I hate it when that happens. What skills? Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Anybody agree, disagree? Need little... Right. Thank you. I think that's excellent. Over here? Critical thinking? Okay. Shall I throw you the treat now? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding because I love the critical thinking one. It's my favorite thing to say on a daily basis. Uh, that's a great point. You know, are our, our standards in communication actually 
not just acceptable, but superlative. You know, are we really trying to get students that are, that are on, on their game and in the way they, they not just talk to each other, but they talk to clients and talk to their managers, talk to ever. Other comments here? Nothing new? Well, one of the things that I've learned so much from my students, and maybe you have too, is their uh, incredible ability to plagiarize. And so I would suggest that you learn from them and learn to plagiarize too, because one of the things that I've found to be so helpful recently is something from the Lumina Foundation called the DQP, the Degree Qualification Profile. And one of the really neat things about this is they identify on that first column, intellectual skills that they believe, in fact, they develop this with faculty all over the United States, are critical for today's students. And you'll see the critical thinking there in analytic inquiry, but notice the other things that they've identified, being the best possible users of information resources, learning to engage, engage, not accept, not accept, engage diverse perspectives, learning how to be ethical reasoners and guys, you know this as well as I do, technology is introducing new issues that we don't even begin to understand how to deal with the ethics on. Seriously, some of the ethical stuff, I mean, when you can literally embed little cameras and things in insects and let the insects fly off and spy on things, I mean, one, there's a whole question of should we be embedding things in insects to start with, and then we move to, and then what happens if the insect, no, never mind, but, you know, think about the little insect. Which insects? I mean, in Texas, we'd like to get rid of roaches, you know, but you may have other ones that are your not faves. Um, quantitative fluency. How many of you have seen that kids today, if you ask them to do even basic math, will immediately get out their iPhone or their phone and do it when they could do it in their head or you can do it in your head? I mean, I keep simplifying grading structures and it's never simple enough. I mean, they're like, really? I have students that reach junior years of college that don't know how to calculate percentages. It's like, that's a basic work, workplace skill. And then you've already identified uh, communication fluency. What I really like about the DQP, it's one of my most favorite discoveries, is these learning domains that run across the top because the DQP's argument is these intellectual skills should manifest in every single learning or knowledge domain. So in specialized knowledge like engineering, you want all of those intellectual skills at play. I mean, you're not gonna have an engineer if they don't get some basic ideas about load structures and tolerance, et cetera, on, on buildings. In nursing, you're gonna be really screwed up if they don't know the difference between veins and arteries uh, on some fronts. This isn't gonna work well when the little units are injecting things. You know what I'm saying? So you need specialized kinds of knowledge in every one of our disciplines. We understand that. In fact, that's the part we're really usually most addicted to. But students also need to learn to, to integrate knowledge across disciplines and in various ways. This is where we really start to stumble because it involves us reaching out to other disciplines outside of our silos. And we don't usually reach out to others inside of our silo uh, so particular well. Applied and collaborative learning, this is our ability to interact academic and non-academic settings. So sending people into the field to learn to do things, whether it's in civic engagement, engineering, the health sciences, epidemiology, um, writing, the media, et cetera. We could keep business, we could keep going on and on. So really this is praxis and kids today love this part and I think you know this, the ability to try out what they actually know is really, really important. And then the last part, civic and global learning, which is preparing students to live in a democratic society. So I live in about 15 minutes from the DFW area, and one of the things that's happened in that particular area where I live is that the Indian population has grown significantly. And so um, there have been numbers of changes at Coppell High School. One, one of the things that you see now at Coppell High School is that You'll have to forgive me on this. Most of the students, the regular Coppell citizens there can't pronounce their last names. You know, they're Asian or Indian, literally. Nine out of 10, nine out of 10 of the top 10 grads will ultimately be on that different kind of work ethic. But I think there's something more at play here that, that those of us that are US citizens don't think so much about. And that is other countries 
understand far better what it means to play in a global world than our students do because they come here and they function here. They know what democracy means in India, for example. They understand what democracy means in the United States, and they get it in ways that we don't. And they have greater confidence about functioning in a global world because guess what? They have. They have. We don't get students more than 15 minutes away from home enough. Does that make sense? We are living in this US silo also and not shoving students out saying it's not going to be good enough just to be here you need to take your butt to china you need to go to india you need to see africa oh by the way you know if you think things are different with how they flush toilets in england they at least speak a language that you call english you know and oh by the way you can do it you know and your life will be richer for it in the process and so I think for us, the challenge with US-based students is to say, get out there, as they say on Royal Caribbean, and experience something else. And if you want some diversity, by God, you can start by sending them to Texas. I mean, <laughs> we'll show them some diversity down in Texas. I mean, my God, we do things kind of different there. You know, so you can come on down. So I teach this civic engagement class. I told the earlier folks that I I ditched things after a really tough last semester, put all the little units in communities, assigned them into communities of 10 each, where their grade is partly staked on how well they function in these self-governing communities, uh, which is sort of interesting because I really wanted to increase problem-solving skills and, and having them be more engaged. Here's what they told me, though, about working in groups, which drop, I almost dropped dead. This was, Monday, I asked them in class, tell me how you feel about this, because I was ready for them to be whining. Well, I don't like my group partners, and they're nasty, and you know. But notice that, look at the number of students. 86% roughly are saying that they're happy living and working in this community life. I was stunned. I was literally stunned by this particular kind of deal, which means that somehow I've stumbled on it. We were talking about what it is. What did you do? Well. I'm not totally sure. I don't know, but I can tell you that they are engaged in this process because I've taught enough to know that they hate working in groups and they hate their grade being tied to others. And these kids are saying, okay. And by the way, they're really mean to each other in the process of doing this. But what I really wanted to say to you with this slide is not to spend a lot of time telling you about my, my civic engagement community life simulation in which I play God and have come to enjoy it. They have governance and I'm God. Every week things happen to them in their communities and I subtract points and then things happen to individuals that are good and bad. And it's really cool because I sit on Sunday and I think when everybody else is at church, and I don't have to be because I'm God, sorry. So I think, what am I gonna do little units tomorrow? You know, what kind of disasters are gonna wipe out their community and how much? You know, shall I send plague and pestilence? You know, shall good things happen like Apple open a plant in their community and increase their tax base? What shall I do to them as individuals? This feels really good. Are they going to, will they be unemployed? Will they have devastating illness? You know, will, you know, any number of things happen. But I tell you this because what I want you to really get is that facilitating engaged student learning isn't about just one technique. It isn't about learning some kind of technique. Although that, he that helps, I mean, that certainly helps. Really, facilitating engaged student learning is an us enterprise. It's an us thing. We, we, we are the ones that facilitate engaged student learning, and we do that by ending the conspiracy of commodity education. And what that means is students pay a very high price for a product that they're often happy to skip. You know, imagine going and spending a thousand bucks for a TV and you don't care if it turns on. You know, education is one of the few things that people will spend a lot of money on and try to get out of. And we, we, we too often go along with them in the process because we are so busy in other things. Oh, by the way, oh yeah, we'll let class out 15 minutes early today because, oh, by the way, you've just worn me into the ground. You know what I'm saying? Or, I, you're right, too many of you little units failed this assignment even though it was very, very clear and you didn't follow the instructions. I will let you re redo it. We, we must stop this. 
and we must focus on teaching, and we must start to really ask ourselves how much we value it to the point that we're willing to recognize that teaching like doing good research takes skill and that you have to pay people and reward people and focus on it if you want it to happen. You have to do great faculty development. You have to encourage people to get there, sometimes with a whip. You know, that, that also helps. You have to get faculty to do more experiential learning and to, to literally go into detox, which means get over the crack of content-based education, which says, I'm the sage on the stage, and I'm the one that's the fount of all information, in spite of the fact that the little units can Google you faster on facts than you can practically spit and throw this stuff out. We, we, we have to develop a better understanding of millennial culture, and we have to meet them. It's our world that's gone away. Theirs is the one that's here to stay. We must be speakers of digital language. Sorry about that. I mean, unless you're ready to retire and have someone run your life for you while you're in some new nursing home, I mean, we better figure this out. We have to start working collaboratively to develop, here it is, consensus-based learning outcomes that are relevant to the 21st century, not to the 19th century and the 20th century, the 21st century, the one that we woke up in this morning which means that our curriculum, which is collaboratively and consensus-based, has to be integrative and holistic. And oh, by the way, it's neither right now. For the most part, if we're really honest with ourselves, it's still the helter-skelter curriculum that we've used all through the industrial era, et cetera. We have to engage colleagues in other disciplines in other disciplines and folks outside in the business world and in the community and private sector to develop learning experiences that integrate the academy and the real world in the process because kids today want to know why it's relevant to them. Why should they care? Well, because, oh, by the way, you're getting ready to collide with the real world. We need macros microscopic thinkers. For example, we don't need someone that's great at criminal justice that understands only what it's like to deal with, a, like we have an emergency, an ice storm here that goes out. We need people that understand public safety, which means we need disaster planners, public administrators, and criminal justice working together. Those are three different disciplines. We need that to come together. We need more kinds of learning opportunities. And here is the really, this, if you're thinking I'm yelling at you, it's because I am. How on earth can we tell our students to work in teams and be so sorry at it ourselves? And you know as well as I do when we sit in faculty meetings, which are miserable, because we are such miserable team players ourselves. We can't tell them how to do it unless we learn how to do it ourselves and model it in the process. And I'm sorry, sort of be hard on us, but I think we need to be hard on ourselves about some of this stuff, and I want to just go on the record again and saying is, I'm not too thrilled about this either, because sometimes, you know, Joe or somebody else makes me frickin' nuts just like they make you nuts along the way. I don't deny that some of us are really difficult, and I'm probably one of them. We need to imagine new ways to offer education. We need to start thinking instead of these linear, sequential things, competency-based stuff, which recognizes that people will get skills and they'll pile up in one area, and why should they have to sit through stuff when they already have got that? If we can identify what that competency is and effective ways to measure it, let them move on. It's a more efficient way to do things. We need to be great at experimenting with new technologies in terms of delivery methods. We must become masters at assessment, which is something we've never wanted to mess with because we want to go back to our research. You know, it's like, just give us five minutes to teach this and then I'll go back and do my other thing. We have to figure out how to assess and measure whether students are actually learning because it isn't just about burping out kids that have certain kinds of skill sets. This really is a bigger issue for us. This is a global kind of question. I mean, we have a tendency just to resist assessment beyond course grades, but if you think about course grades, they're just junk. They're like casseroles. They're full of skill sets and other kinds of thing, and they're full of attendance. They're full of extra credit. 
So you get a B in a history course. What does that mean that you've learned? It may mean you were great at the Civil War, but you sucked at World War II. Does it make sense? And oh, by the way, who cares if you know about the Civil War and World War II? What really is the intellectual skill that you want someone to come away with in history for that in the process? We also need to think about retention just as something besides keeping people that we consider crappy students. We really need to think about retention through a learning lens. So why is this so hard to do? You're thinking, I know, I'm gonna leave here and go drink. Well, because we fail to see or we don't wanna see the need, and by the way, I'm gonna go back and stick my head in the sand because it makes me feel better for a few minutes. But I think the, the middle one is that we feel like if we change, we're gonna end up in a worse place than we were before we started. We fear the change because we feel the penalties associated with the change. We fear failure. We feel it. I mean, we, we don't want to fail in the process. We're afraid of the consequences to our, our evaluations, to our pay, to what our colleagues will think. We're afraid of it. And mostly, I don't think we want to go it alone. But I'm telling you, we can't afford to bury our heads in the sand anymore. Remember the post office? Well, let me help you on that. That was the government subsidized business that was able to ignore, let me see, UPS, FedEx, Emory, um, who else? Yeah, they, they just kept, we, we've got plenty of business. These other businesses can form on the side. Uh, oh, by the way, the US Postal Service had this big steady market with a dependable cash flow and customers that paid up front. Does that sound familiar? Big, steady, dependable market of students coming in, big old pipeline, government subsidies. Oh, by the way, we keep turning those down in Texas. It's really hurting. My suspicion is the same thing is happening in Illinois. And customers that pay in advance for services, and we've already got their money, the quality measures. Mm. So what's happening to the post office today? It's bankrupt. Most of us don't even know why we need it anymore. How many of you get real letters in the mail? What, about five? This year I had depression at Christmas because there were no real Christmas cards. Nobody sends real Christmas cards anymore. They come in electronic greetings that sing at you. And you know, I was sort of missing the real ones and the nice paper and things, and then I realized how old I was in the process on this. Step back and ask yourselves from people to the outside, how are we perceived in higher, higher education today? They think we're expensive. They think that we're not very efficient. I mean, this is what people say to me regularly in my neighborhood. It makes me angry. What are you doing today? Are you teaching? I just really want to send them one of those digit signals. You know what I'm saying? With my fingers, I just identify a special one and send it out, you know? Of course, I mean, they think that, you know, you teach two or three classes or four classes, well, that couldn't be that hard. I mean, what are you doing? They think that we're behind the curve in technology. So we've got a broken system. We've got competition on the rise, for-profit enterprises, MOOCs, libraries, government. The government does great stuff these days, great educational stuff that's out there. I mean, you can send kids to government websites and other kinds of things, in our country at least, and you get really, really great stuff. So this is why I'm here. Denial's not working anymore for me. I keep telling myself, maybe next semester it'll get better. Last semester, it, didn't, it not only didn't get better, I just almost went in the tank. Blaming students doesn't seem to work if I wanna stay employed. I mean, I either need to figure out how to deal with this, or I need to get out. I mean, I, I really need to get out. Um, I don't have the answers on teaching, all of them. I mean, I, I, it was such great therapy this morning to work with some of your folks because when we sat down and talked to each other, we discovered that it, we could all ha hold hands and sing out of the same hymn book, you know, in terms of the issues that we were having. You're in Illinois, I'm in Texas. You know, these are my new best friends. I mean, it's just amazing the kinds of things that you experience in the process. But I really, really, really got into this business because I wanted to make a difference. I really could have had a very, very fat retirement check coming in from IBM. Um, but I really am happy with where my heart is in higher education because that really is where my heart is. So I would say to you, I need your help. Um, can I count you in in the process?
I think the only way we make this work is if we hold hands and do it together. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. they have some questions. Yep, but I'm aware that their lunch hour approaches, which means they might have one question. Does anybody have any questions? There you go. That's funny. That's the second time I've been asked that this morning. I like the idea of saying John. Um, I, I actually told, <laughs> no, I told Michaela I would send her the, all the soft copy on that so she could pass it out. It was, a, it was an experiment born out of utter frustration. And so I, I because I was angry about some things associated with systematic cheating in my class last fall. And um, so I literally tied in the simulation in, in, that I set up they have to take quizzes every week uh, as a group. And they can either share answers or not. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and that's really got its own fun part associated with it. Uh, because then really quickly they start to identify who's doing the work and who isn't. Uh, and by the way, they're ruthless. So these quizzes are worth 10 points each. There are 10 of them. And they can take them in their community. So once I've assigned them into the community, they have to stay in that community and sit in that community for the entire semester. It's not open seating. So they take these quizzes in the first 10 minutes. If you're absent, there's no makeup. If you're late, you can't take it. Um, so I make these little communities tax the quiz scores. And the taxes go into a community chest. And then they have to figure out how they're going to provide support networks for students who are absent or who have wild things happen to them, like unemployment or whatever else. So they pay out of their community chest. But the cool part is they have to develop attendance policy. They have to develop support policy. They have to develop, if they don't like their communities, they can immigrate. They have to develop immigration policies. Um, they have to develop governance structures. And then they have to implement and run their policies. And they are totally responsible. So as I told my colleagues earlier, Monday, two mayors they're the only ones that could submit policy pieces, forgot to do it. And so they threw themselves at the altar of God, that would be me, and said, can anything happen with this? Can you forgive me? And I said, I can, but I won't fix your grade. I mean, you're going to have to go to your communities and say, you know, I screwed this up. And you can offer to make up the 20-point deficit that just hit because you didn't turn in your policy piece. Uh, you could just subtract it off of your own grade. <laughs> or you can go beg your community. So they said, okay, okay, which was extraordinary because they they went back to their communities and had to sit down as mayor and explain that they screwed the community and 20 points came out of the community chest in the process. Uh, so it's been the most interesting exercise I've done in my career uh, because uh, they talk about it outside of class. They come and see me which I told them is wonderful because they tell me stuff which allows me to play God more effectively. Like they, a couple of them announced that as mayor they were able to manipulate their group members real effectively. So that really frustrated me. So I told my grad assistant that God would act. Um, and so one week they're going to come in and the thing, we roll every week for these community incidents that happen in these personal incidents. Some of the communities were going to have mayor and treasurer caught in fraudulent behavior Minus three point for students in the, in the community payable to the chest, mayor and treasurer deposed. You have to come up with new leadership in the process, which is totally like real life, right? When was the last time you read about a politician stealing from the till? You know, sort of deal. So uh, I would be happy to share, and we were talking about how it could be uh, adapted to other disciplines where you tie part of someone's grade into work together. And I actually have pictures on my iPhone of them. Uh, sitting in class together collaborating on things. And I did do something also that was very different this semester. I, in, I have a new learning outcome, and that is follow directions, stupid, to the letter. And, and so when they submit these policy papers, I have very specific instructions about what they need to look at like when they come in. And if they don't, I just knock the snot out of them. I mean, you know, and it, it's taken like one week, and all of a sudden they, they salute differently, and the whole... <laughs> mechanism of doing that but 
and, and I explained why. I said, look, you know, you, you just can't turn this kind of junk in. And in my syllabus, minus two points for every single occurrence of a misspelled word. I don't care. I mean, I don't go, well, they, if they use it 50 times, 100 points off, the whole thing goes. And I tell them, I mean, there's no reason for you to misspell words. Zero. Grammar problems. Minus two points every single occurrence. You know, you can't turn junk in, you know. So, I, I, and I can't even believe I'm doing this. I, I, I can't believe I'm doing it because I wouldn't have thought that was where I needed to be. But it's sort of like, I, you know, I go back to denial. The denial is kind of over with. Like, you play the hand you're dealt. And the one that I'm dealt is I'm going to be teaching etiquette and I'm going to be teaching basic, this is how you write a respectful email. And, oh, by the way, don't fill an email full of misspelled errors to your boss. They think you're an idiot, you know, sort of thing. So, but the community simulation they love and they talk about all the time. Be happy to share. <laughs> they think it's fun too and I love being God. And I can change dynamically. You know, I can, I can hurl things at them every week, which is new and different. So I love that part. I love it. Does anybody else have a question? I think that's a great idea. I, one of the things I think that's a, one of the things that my faculty is scheduled to do is to sit down with the DQP and map our assignments and our courses against that grid that I showed you because that's one thing that we don't do as faculty is now students learn better if it's cumulative. So if like we have a problem solving exercise and you can do it in different courses, but if you agree together like mine's at an entry level, yours is a medium level, and yours is at the highest level and we figure out how to sequence that, then the kids go, oh, this looks like it was planned. Well, go figure. So, but the other thing we have talked about, because I now have responsibility for social work, is putting peer reviews into exercises. Social work is an accredited discipline. And so, basically, what we'll do is in practice one, we'll have group activities, peer reviews associated with it. Um, so new group, practice two, peer reviews. So we start getting a student that doesn't play nice in the sandbox outside of in a multiple course arrangement. We call the student in and say, uh, you may not be in this major much longer because, oh, by the way, social workers have to be able to work with people. And apparently, you don't get that. I mean, this is a real issue for you. I mean, people don't like you. And you know, it's like people not liking their vet. I mean, there are people that are just generally really likable, social workers, vets. You know, it's like we can't have somebody come out that's like a social worker that people want to murder. I mean, you know, this isn't a good thing. And so, yes, that's our cross-disciplinary thing, but problem solving across courses would be awesome cool. That'd be, it would take planning. But it, it still was fun. I mean, we've had fun with this so far because it's so fun to be God. My graduate student jumps up and down. I mean, she's like, what are we going to do to him this week? Policy is hard. Writing policy, which I have them do every week, is hard because there are always unintended consequences. And that's what they discover in the process is for every absence they try to draw a line around, now they're on the other side of it. Usually they're in telling me why their absence should qualify as excused under my policy. Now I throw it back at them and they're, it's just too fun to watch them try to figure out how to define excused absence. They, and, and that, that is a critical thinking skill because they are having to analyze in their own mind and they also see that they want to define it to their own advantage, which is also interesting. They are mean to each other in self-governance. We were talking about that earlier too. They're far meaner than you would ever be. It's wonderful. <laughs> and they like you, I mean, they, they like me in the process and they're mean to each other, which I have to tell you is a breath of fresh air. Love it, love it. You can be mean to each other and, and then give me good evals. It'll be perfect. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. I, 
You know, I think that's a really great question, and I struggle with it. Uh, he's asking, how do you get students to do things outside of class? If you're at UNT like I am, uh, and I don't know what it's like here at Northern Illinois, I've got tons of non-traditional students. Most of our students are working and going to school. So when they're saying they really are having outside class conflicts, they, they really mean it. I mean, which has caused me in this splendid class to want to turn up the class time again, another 30 minutes, so I reclaim that much time in the classroom for pure group work, and I don't expect it you know, because I, I won't get it. And I have discussion boards up too. Uh, I could put little police monitors on that to make sure that they're doing that. But some of the discussions like for policy just don't work as well on a discussion board as they would in a face-to-face -face kind of arrangement with me present. So I think you have to plan for that uh, to a certain degree. Now, if you're in collaborative learning environments, you know, these service learning based arrangements, I think that's different because you're putting the student completely in that environment uh, in a group kind of context. But when you're trying to teach them some specialized skill and have them work together, that's different. And you just, I think you, again, you, you can try to swim against the current and see how long before you're exhausted and swept over the falls, or you can look for another technique to see if you can deliver equivalent outcomes. Well, I think that's a very good question. Um, in this particular class, um, I was telling you then my retention from last semester, I probably had a 30, 33, 34% DFWI rate because I caught students systematically cheating and busted them. And so the DFWI, the number of Ds, Fs, withdrawns and incompletes went through the ceiling. Uh, my DFWI rate in this class has hovered at about right at the university average of 20%. What I would tell you though, and I just was in, I'm on a retention committee with UNT, was we really need to figure out in our own minds, I mean, having this one size fit all retention gradient of like 20%, what does that mean? I mean, certain like engineering, certain courses in engineering are gonna be different than others. Like some of the math courses struggle with different things than other kinds of courses. And so I think you have to almost look at retention measured by instructor, by course type. And we find, by the way, that online classes, the retention problems are always more significant. So am I gonna punish a professor who's teaching an online course who has a higher DFWI rate? No, if I can trend show that, that, that online courses traditionally have higher drop rates and failure rates than I have in other kinds, I can't. So I think that we have to ask ourselves you know, what really is realistic and then set realistic benchmarks on retention and work against more, um, um, more refined metrics. Does that make sense? And we haven't done that. We're, we're just really starting at UNT on that front. I think it's easier for us to just beat our chest and yell retention, 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 and not really ask ourselves what we're really trying to accomplish in retaining. Because quite frankly, I was happy to ditch all of those uh, cheaters. I mean, I laughed all the way to the bank on that after I finished crying a lot over other things. So does that make sense? I mean, I think we have a lot of work to do on retention, and I don't think it's, you know, I, learning communities help, getting students connected with each other helps, uh, but I, I think that if you look at other businesses in the private sector and the technology firms, they have very, very directed, specific quality control measures that they are looking at all the time. And we don't have any practice in that in higher ed because we've never thought of ourselves in that way before. We've never thought in those terms. And I just am saying that I think it's time that we do. So when administration is saying, does it make a huge difference to keep 50 students? Well, financially in Texas, it makes a huge difference in formula funding. I mean, so when you don't have enough money to do a lot of other things that you and I want to do, I hear that side of the argument that says, if you'll keep some kids, we'll get it there. But we don't want to do that at the expense of quality. I mean, we don't. And I don't think administration wants us to do that at the expense of quality. I think, well, I think most administrators don't want us to do that at the expense of quality. 
you know, for sure. But I'm going to take my charts into the next retention management meeting. That's hot, hot discussions at where I'm from. Really hot discussions because that's one of the president's new initiatives. Other questions? Thanks so much for having me here. It's been great to be back in Illinois. You know, for sure, in spite of, I've got this new fog experience so I can go home and talk about. Have a wonderful weekend.